Matthew the seventh chapter. The first five verses there of the seventh chapter. Probably one of the most discussed verse of scriptures in all the Bible. Most every unsaved person who doesn't even know the Lord has memorized a certain portion of this scripture. You know, not hardly talk to anyone today, and they know the Bible said, Judge not, lest you be judged, or all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that is the word of God, but uh, don't uh, misuse uh, the Bible. And when you, we get through here tonight, maybe God would show you something about this verse of Scripture. The Bible said, Judge not, that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And uh, this happens in a lot of people's lives. God has a law, and the law is uh, whatever you plant is going to come up. And it usually comes up a lot more than what you planted. Amen. And so if you talk about and judge everybody in town, God will make sure that you get it back about fourfold. Amen? Amen. That is the law of the heart. What's of your soul? That shall you also reap. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now, God was not saying, did not say here, that if your brother had a little speck in his eye, that you couldn't take a handkerchief and a light and get it out. I've had people to say, preacher, there's something in my eye. Would you please look? But some people are looking when they haven't even asked you to look. Amen. Amen. And uh, sometimes you're looking when uh, they might have a little speck in their eye. But it's hard to see that speck when you've got a two before in your own eye. Amen. All right. Now, the Bible said in verse 4, Or uh, wilt thou say to the brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam, a beam is in thine own eye. Now, that's a beam up there. Now, God said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Now, you see, the Bible did not say that you couldn't get the moat out of your brother's eye. It just said, Make sure that yours was clear first. See? God didn't say, don't uh, try to uh, help your brother. He didn't say, try to help instruct your brother. He said, just don't do it while you had a beam in your eye. Now, let's go back to that first verse there where it said, judge not. And this is assuming, you as a Christian, assuming the office of a judge. God didn't call you to be the judge. He's the judge. Amen? Now, when you assume the office of a judge and... A lot of times we go out uh, with the Bible and we stop and we see somebody and we begin to talk to them and we read them the Bible. When we read them the Bible, they get angry and say, hey, don't judge me. Well, say, no, no, sir, you don't understand. I was not judging you. I just read you out of the Bible. It says the Bible is very clear. It says, and, and all drunkards and liars and thieves and whoremongers shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now, I've quoted that verse of Scripture, and people would jump up and say, Don't you be sticking your finger at me. I hadn't said anything. I was just reading the Bible. They say, I wasn't judging you. I was, I'd like to say this. You know, there's nothing against the, uh, the law, and there's sure not nothing against knowing the law. Amen? In other words, if you're driving down the street, there's nothing wrong with knowing when you're in the school zone and know it there's the law and says 20 miles an hour and somebody runs by you and you toot your horn at him and says, better watch out, he's right down the street. And he's run down there, he is sitting there. That guy passing him uh, food stamps out, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and he points his hand at you, you go by and say, judge not! You ever hear anybody? No, they don't say that. 
you blink your lights and tell somebody there's a radar right down the road, slow down. And, uh, you know, they, they toot the horn, thank you for it, you know, because they don't want to pay a $150 ticket. Now, there's nothing wrong with a child of God knowing the law and telling what God said about the law. Nothing wrong with that. Let me say this tonight. There's nothing against the law, and it's sure not a, it's sure not a sin to say the law said, and read them what God's Word said. Now, Jesus said, uh, except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We'll just take this Brother Jones here. He's a preacher from up in the hall of Howell. And Brother Jones has been saved for a number of years. But just say that Brother Jones wasn't saved. And I walked in his business and I said, Now, Brother Jones, I'm, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry. Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And the first thing he would say about that when he was unsaved, he said, uh, You're not supposed to judge me. I said, Brother Jones, I, Mr. Jones, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what Jesus said in the Bible, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Brother Jones, you did this and I did it. I always said, don't you be judging me. And I said, I'm not judging you. I'm reading you what Jesus said. You understand? And so you've got to be careful about telling people every time they read you the Bible, that'd be just like a policeman. He stopped you on the street and said, hey, sir. You was running 80 mile an hour, and that's 20 mile an hour. You stick your finger and said, hey, man, judge God. He said, quit. <laughs> he said, we'll let the judge see about this. Amen? Yeah. Take you right downtown and, uh, and tell the judge something funny about this guy. He's strange. He said, he's tried to stop me from writing him a ticket. And he kept screaming, judge not, judge not. That's the way a lot of folks do at the church. Amen. Amen. Now, to assume the office of a judge. But here it says, judge not. Judge not. And uh, what these people were doing, they were judging one another. They said, he's not saved. You don't know who's saved. You don't know who's saved. All I can do is if you tell me you've never been born again, then I know you're not saved. Because that's what you said. And Jesus said, except you be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. So when I tell you what Jesus said, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what the Lord said. And I, I've had people that just uh, just uh, stagger out in front of me and, and said, I'll just tell you one thing. I don't like the church. I, I hate the church. And, and uh, you say, why don't you sober up? Don't be judging me. And you know the Bible said, judge not lest you be judged. Yeah, and when you judge the church... You can remember she's the wife of the Lord Jesus. And one day he's coming. And you said he's going to be so happy. No, he's going to be mad at you for talking about his wife. The church of God is the wife of Christ. Now what would you do if somebody talked about your wife? You said, I'd make smash upon her nose. What do you think he's going to do? Amen. And he's big enough to do whatever he wants to do. Amen. That makes it rough. All right. All right. But the Bible said, judge not lest you be judged. Now, this is assuming the office of a judge. What does a judge have the power to do, by the way? The judge has the power to hear the case, decide the case, and sentence the defendant. Now, God said, you can't do that. You can't do that. All you can do is put out the Word, and if somebody asks you a question, you can answer it out of the Word of God, but you don't have any right to judge a person. And I, I've had people tell me, well, I'm, I'm saved, but Bobby, you've had people tell you in prison, they say. Amen. I've had some people, and you probably went down a little bit. Well, that guy's a convict. I don't believe he's saved. But then you know, you go out here and knock on the door, and the guy says, well, I'm saved. And you know, he ought to be in jail. I, I know some of them down there today uh, in the courthouse ought to be in jail. Amen. Yeah. They ought to be in prison. They ought to be in prison. Yeah. I mean, all they ever did was steal. I, I, saw, I, I saw a fellow today in the paper, and he had a bandolier wrapped around his chest. And he had shotgun shells. And he had a shotgun. And you know what they said? They said the FBI drove him crazy. Now, he was born a little bit goofy and got crazy as he went along. And he wound up with a bullet in his head and then blamed it on the police. Hey, the police didn't tell him to build a Black Panther movement. Amen, Brother Wood. Amen. Mr. Mr. Newton and Mr. Newton said, uh, you and Newton said three or four times, man, I'm sorry. I'm born again. Well, he said, I even seen moon one day up in the sky. Yeah, okay. 
But you can't assume the office of a judge. Amen? You can't, you can't sentence a man. You can't say, well, he's going to hell and you go on to hell. No, you, you're not the judge. You're not the judge. But to assume the office of a judge. Be careful, Christian. Be careful assuming that office. Now, let me say this. You can never try a man without legal counsel. And nobody, nobody, nobody gets tried in America unless they appoint him a lawyer. They appoint him a lawyer to try him. And sometimes in Christian circles, they just try people who are not even there. And uh, they'll just write up a big article in their newspaper and publish it. Just like it's a God on his truth. Just like it's a gospel. And the man's not even there. You know, years ago, and this offends a lot of people here. It offends a lot of people. We don't never try anybody that's not here. We just go in the office and we say, Brother Dan, what did you say? What, what did you mean? Brother what, what, Dan, what did you mean? Well, you know, is this the way we do it, Brother Bible? Well, we don't go around and talk about you. We go in the office and get it settled. Amen. And come out and everybody's hugging each other's neck. And I, I, I've, had, I've had two people here recently to tell me two different families said, I didn't intend to come in this office. Why? You've been running your mouth outside. Surely you wouldn't mind what you said to yourself. I don't care what nobody said. I'll say what I think. I'll say what you please. Yeah, you say what you please. Amen. Yeah. He, he, he got some now. You said, I, I don't have to listen to Brother Woods. No, that's right. Let me just give you this. If Brother Woods died tonight and never got up in the morning, there's nothing would even change at Shady Acre Baptist Church. Amen. The beliefs of Shady Acre Baptist Church, the dress code of Shady Acre Baptist Church, the mission program of Shady Acre Baptist Church. If Brother Wood didn't live till in daylight, if you come over in the morning and find me dead, you'll say, well, praise God. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going they're not as old as I am. They ain't got as much grace as I have, honey. They'd run you off. Oh, you said, Brother Wood. Somebody said, that's just Brother Wood's idea. No, 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 no. It's Shady Acres' idea. It's Shady Acres' got some conviction. Now, don't blame uh, everything this bunch of fools do on me. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean, Joe, uh, he got a bunch of bastard conviction. Pour down his hole. You think just because I died, uh, he changed? You think Bobby Cox had changed? Well, listen, Bobby Cox has done experience some things that I've been preaching for years. Brother Bobby got up uh, yesterday and was it my Tuesday, Brother Bobby went down to prison and he walked in the prison. And the two worst men on the whole penitentiary had got saved. The two, the two kings then, the two ringleaders in the whole penitentiary God. had done God said, One of them tattooed on his head and two on his arm. Tattooed. The two meanest men in the whole prison had got saved. Had got saved. And another man walked up and said, Ah, got saved too. Yeah. I mean, before Brother Bobby said, Get out of there, I guess. It. On that Clinton prison farm, three men told him they'd done got saved Sunday while Brother Bobby was a preacher. And you think Brother Bobby, why you say, uh, Brother Bobby, why if Brother Jack would die, one man said a long time ago, said when Rick Wyman told me won't be no street work. You know, he must have been ignorant or a liar, one of the other. Amen. Rick's been gone three years, honey, and it's true. It's true. Now they done quit preaching on the street and got him a tent. They're crazy, all of them. Amen. Don't blame it on poor Rick. Old Rick's trying to reach somebody in East Germany. And Rick's trying to go over there, and they're coming this way now. They said they had 2,000 passed over in the last month. Now, you can't, you can't try a man without, you must be well represented. See, that's what happened to Jesus. They got him in there, took him in and tried him, and sent him to death without a lawyer. Your master never had a lawyer. Your Lord never had a lawyer. But I'll tell you one thing, you don't have to go to bat without a lawyer. We got a lawyer. Amen. Amen. We got an advocate. We got a good lawyer. Best lawyer, if you please. Amen. And so, uh, don't you be going over to your house. See, you don't have all of the information. And that's the reason some of you ladies need to quit helping Brother Wood pastor the church. Uh, you'll see, you don't have all the information. Amen? Amen. 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 One, one person said to me, they said, I, I just don't, don't understand. 
Yeah, but see, the reason you don't know, you don't have the facts. And I got all the facts. Well, Brother Wood, I, I believe you ought to let these people preach and this people preach. No, we, you, you better leave that as Brother Wood. That's out of your ballpark. Amen. 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 Thanks. Amen. All right. But now, you can't try a man without counsel. That's the reason when the church here, the Bible said, receive not an accusation against an elder unless there be two or three witnesses. In other words, when we when we go in the office and, that, and I say, Miss So-and-so, did you say this? What's this? So-and-so? You surely didn't say that, did you? And, uh, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. The one said to me, does it then? I said, you surely didn't say that. Ah! Did you? Uh, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I mean, just lying past the dog could try. No, I didn't say that. And uh, I said, just a minute while I step out the door. And I got this lady by the hand. And let this lady in. And I said, what did you say? I spent the whole camp meeting uh, saying, what they said, what they said, what they said. You know, you're running your mouth. Amen. That's right. I, mean, I don't know why people do that. But they do. And the only way you can stop it. Amen. Joe Kelly said, you know what Brother Cox said? And I said, what did you say, Brother Cox? Tell Brother Joe what you said. Well, people don't like that. They said, that offends me. No, you're the one that offended God. You're the one that offended the church. And what you want to be is just a gossiper, and the, the church won't let you, and you're mad. Amen. Now, wait just a minute, honey. While you pout, I'll get you one of them little things you stick in your mouth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. But you can't try a man without legal counsel. And let, let me say this. You can't hear a case unless you've got the facts laying like that. Now, uh, when they bring a man before a judge, or if a lawyer takes a man before a judge, he says, he walks in there and he says, Judge, would you mind giving me 90 days to prepare this case? We're not prepared to defend this case. We're not prepared. I mean, why would you take a man there without the facts? And I've seen people try, criticize, and condemn without one fact in the world. And everybody in the world accepted. Now, I'm going to tell you something. For a man to tell a lie on another man is terrible. For you to accept it as a real Christian is Amen. wicked. Because what you've done, you've become a part of what this wicked man done. you come just a bigger part as he is. And you know, the Bible said, judge not. Then why are you judging that man? You don't want anybody to judge you. You don't want anybody to criticize you. You don't want anybody to openly say anything to you. But let me ask you a question. When you've opened your mouth, as we read in the paper here the other day about one of our, one of the top leading men in America, and then the evangelist goes down to the Hammond News in Hammond, Indiana, and puts that same thing in the Hammond paper. Now, the Bible says, what did the Bible say? That love, but said love covered what? A multitude of sin. It covered a multitude of sin. I, I was reading the book. The, the, the book, the name of the book is uh, Twice Given, Brother Bobby, is that Twice Given. I, my woman makes sure that Brother Bobby and Kathy gets that book. It's one of the most tremendous little books you put your hands on. But anyway, uh, 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 Brother Howes uh, had this man up there, and his wife had, uh, he had hauled her for years in a, in a motor home. This woman was unconscious. She never, she'd had some kind of uh, spine or some kind of meningitis, and this woman never regained confidence. And this dear evangelist just put her in his motor home and hauled her and hauled her and hauled her. And people begin to say, you know that man that's hauling that woman around, and that woman's paralyzed, and that woman can't move, and that woman can't get out of that, and uh, that man's hauling her around. Why don't we take her and get her some And finally took her to one of the biggest Craig clinics, one of the biggest clinics in America, and uh, they examined her. He'd had her in that motor home four years. And he, and he, Tom Williams asked him, said, uh, oh, what do you think? And that man said, sir, I just want to tell you about the therapy that you used. He said, the third, he said, every joint and every nerve in her body's loose. He said, how many hours have y'all spent? He said, literally, thousands of hours traveling a highway, working on her arms and her joints. He said, you've done more than we could have ever dreamed about doing. Yeah, okay. And he said, you know, I, I'd like to tell you this. He said, you know, he said, years ago, we had a man here at Craig Clinic. They claimed he was one of the greatest uh, uh, neurosurgeons in the world. And uh, he said, uh, you know, we had a man here, and uh, he was completely unconscious. Had been that way about nine months. He didn't speak. He couldn't move. He never opened his eyes, never said a word. And nine months. 
And he said, you know, uh, the daddy came from Alaska and said, uh, we're going to take this boy home. He's about 23 or 4 years old, I believe he fell on a motorcycle. And uh, they put him in a, uh, in a plane and flew him back to where they were from. And uh, his brother, three years older than him, just knelt down by the stretcher and got him around the neck and said, How did you just lay? I love you! He said, Nine months of all kinds of treatment didn't do any good. That great surgeon said, But I want to tell you something. He said, There's a lot of people who respond to love, but they won't respond to nothing else. That's true. That's true. And that's what I'm preaching tonight. I'm going to tell you something. A preacher that tells you the truth loves you. And a preacher will call you an office man and say, Look, see, look brother, uh, that, that's just, you know, that, that'll wreck your life. And if you said this, you shouldn't be saying those things. Oh, that's just your friend. That's the best thing you got in the world. Listen, when John the Baptist was tried by Philip, the greatest friend that Philip ever had was John the Baptist. John said, This is the truth. And gave it to him. Listen to me. Listen to me. Your greatest friend is somebody that with tears in their eyes and love in their heart tell you the God the honest truth. And the worst enemy you've got is a liberal preacher. A liberal preacher that'll salve your conscience and lie to you about your soul and let you stumble into hell without God. He's not only your enemy, he's your children's enemy. He's your country's enemy. I, I just like to tell you this today. In World War II, when World War II broke out, seven years before World War II, uh, General MacArthur was standing talking to President Roosevelt. And you know as well as I do that Roosevelt was uh, uh, in a wheelchair most of the time. And, uh, and uh, they had two preachers, two preachers. And that was Harry Emerson Fostick, and uh, I'll call the other in just a moment. And these two preachers come there and said, listen, in 1934, said, listen, we, President, we, this country is in dire need and we need food. We need food! And Mr. MacArthur stood there, and uh, they, they, he was the chief of staff and under Roosevelt, and he said to him, he said, uh, we do not need guns and army! Mr. MacArthur said the Japanese will invade the Philippines within the next ten years. They will be on the Philippines all in ten years. And these two preachers, uh, Niebuhr, Niebuhr and Harry Emerson Fostick, passed two big church in New York City. They said again and again and again until they got the president to do what they wanted to. And MacArthur spoke out and was reprimanded by the president. He said, when that boy's laying on Wake Island in the Philippines with that bayonet in his throat, I hope he cusses you and not me. And in seven years' time, that prophecy became true. That prophecy became true, man. They called him a warmonger. No, he was an American. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. You said he loved war. He never loved war. He was just a warrior. No warrior loves war. No warrior loves war. But the warrior is always, always ready to fight the war. He don't go to Canada and burn his car. He meant all right. But anyway, you got to hear the calls. Nobody hears the calls. Let it be established with two witnesses. Let me say this tonight. Uh, to try the case without the defendant present is criminal. To try the case without the defendant being that is criminal. Who, who would ever hear try the man? Him not that. Him not that is the Nobody that is talking. Just, just have a try. But many back his home at dinner time on Sunday evening. Many other Christians are tried and convicted and condemned and sentenced right in their home. God said, Judge not, lest you be judged. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. You can't try nobody without him being there. He's got to be there. You say, well, they try some people. I know they do, but it's terrible to get tried when you're not in the courtroom. <laughs> at least you can see who's fixing the sentence. Yes. At least you can look at the jury. At least you can get up and say, that's not so. At least you can force your testimony. Sometimes little girls in the church are tried by some big mouth woman. I'm going to tell you something about the state of the church. You're not going to criticize these teenagers and get by with them. Because I ain't going to let you. Right. Amen. Some of them live rough, you said, yes. 
Yes, and I want to tell some of y'all something. Y'all like me. I had a mother that loved God, and I had a daddy that loved God, and I stayed in jail. I was a wonderful child. My mother said all I ever did was read a book. I asked my wife, I said, how did I get arrested so many times reading the book? Now, Chester, you've been down there. Did some of them boys tell you that I've always been a priest? How they come. When Chester got out of the penitentiary, they said, when he come back, he started back to you. They said, go see old Jackie Boy Woods. He'll help you. Now, old Walter Fletcher said, go see Jackie Boy. How did Walter Fletcher know that? I knew Walter Fletcher for 40 years. Hear me? God God never said, go back. Chester, and see Jackie Woods. He'll pray for you and help you. He's lost me. Amen. You can't judge a man unless the defender is present. So if you've got anything to say about Bobby Cox, call him up and tell him over. Call him over and say, listen, uh, me and Duke was just talking about you. Bobby, you want to come over and shut it off. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just come on over. We're fixing to have you fry and stew. Now come on over. Let, let, let me just give you this. This will be a real blessing to you. If anybody calls you up, or anybody comes over to your house talking about somebody else, when you ain't there, they talk about you. Oh, you said that. My best friend, a gossiper, and got no friend. He talk about anybody. You, you watch a gossip. They talk about everybody, and then finally, when they run out, of anybody to talk about. Listen, I'll tell you one thing. God ain't been. They start on God. So now that ain't Jesus sweet. They said, well, that ain't been too sweet to me. They start talking about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> An old gossiper, he's just full of gossip. And he won't gossip ill, he just gossips. Try to, can't try a case without the defendant present. I mean, you've got to t- stand him up there and sentence him and try. And it's funny how when you get two people together, how the stories all change. But would you ever hear anybody with a preconceived idea? No. If I've got a preconceived idea, I'd go outside and ask God to wash my mind out. Well, I don't care what anybody's told me, I don't believe it. I, I, I've got a little old crazy thing inside of me. When you start telling me something, I said, now, I just put a question on that. I turn it over to question. And you tell it all, and I hear every bit of it, and I rest it all that, and don't believe none of it. You said you disbelieve? No, I don't disbelieve. I don't disbelieve it. I don't believe it. Because God said, I cannot listen to you and receive what you say unless they've got two witnesses. Amen. Brother Jones, I guess that's just about to, to if you ever help anybody, counsel anybody, uh, the only way you can help them is you can't go down with a preconceived idea. Amen. Amen. In other words, you just all you're doing is joining up sides. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. They got to be present, and then to accept charges without the witness being verified. Uh, Brother Danny Farley was uh, being a witness at a trial in Conroe here a while back. My son of honor. The man asked him, said, uh, "Brother Farley, where did you go to school?" He said, "Texas A&M." He said, did you finish? He said, yes, sir. Sure. What year did you finish? He said, 74. I graduated from a and I see. Did you go to the, the seminary? He said, yes, sir. I went to seminary. What seminary did you go to? He asked him. He told me. And then he asked him the question. How long have you been a pastor of East River Baptist Church? How long have you knew this man? That's all they told him. Five or six questions. How well do you know this man? He told me. How long has he been there? What was this uh, prosecuting attorney? What was this lawyer doing? He was verifying Danny Farley's character and that he was qualified to give an opinion on this. There's a lot of people giving opinion on things that's not qualified. Now, I, I tell you, I'm not too much qualified about giving an opinion on how to build this building. I'm not I was watching these Mexican boys this morning and yesterday 
put down some towel. I wouldn't be qualified. I was watching him cut that towel and lay that towel and wipe that towel and do all that stuff that time. And I just wouldn't be qualified to tell you what it is. But they looked like to me they was making a mess. But when they got through, it was good. And uh, Brother, uh, Brother Friesen has been working on my house ever since the flood. And uh, some of the men out there with him. And, and I just walk around sometimes. And there's one thing I know that I don't know nothing about it. But you know, it's surprising how many church members I got that knows all about it. They ain't never done it. And uh, when they walk up, they say, well, why don't they do so and so? I said, I asked them, I don't know. And for more, I don't care. I want it fixed, I want it right. And uh, I looked at my living room tonight, and it was fixed, and it was right, and it was pretty. And I said, thank God! If I'd have told him how to do it, you talking about a mess. But you know, I looked at that thing about two weeks ago, and I said, boy, them, them cabinets look ugly. But they weren't the I'm trying to tell you, you can't accept charges. I, I said this the other day in the church, but I, I asked a man over in Australia. He said, no, I, I, I'll be you wasting your money giving it to that man then. And I said, well, that's fine, uh, sir. Uh, uh, he said, I, I wish you'd tell the mission board this is the way I feel. And he's got about 40 churches helping him. And I said, well, that's fine, sir. I said, sir, he, uh, could, I, uh, could I find out if you are a qualified uh, skeptic? I said, sir, have you ever led a soul to Christ? He said, well, you mean if I brought somebody down the aisle myself and led him to Christ? No. I said, sir. Have you ever trained a man in the work of God? Have you, do you have one preacher boy that you trained? Did you tell me you've been saved 21 years? He said, no. I said, then what have you done? He said, I'm a deacon in the church. Yeah. And I said, where's your pastor? Well, he said, three people want to come with me. But I wanted to talk to you my In other words, he said, that pastor's a little child. I'm a deacon. I'm a deacon. I'm running that church. Yes, sir. He said, you know what that man preached when he came to our church? He preached in our church and we were carnal Christians. I said, if he preached that to me, I said, amen. <laughs> and so then I changed the subject and tried to show this man where he was going in his own life. But this man was not a qualified. I said, sir, are you trying to tell me to go back and tell Dr. Ruckman that he trained this man for three years and that he wasted his time? And you want me to tell his daddy, who's a preacher, seven, 63 years old, that he's wasting his time? And you want me to tell Homer Smith and, and all the preachers that you in Australia know more about him than they do? I said, sir, you let a message get a hold of you. It's going to destroy you and your children. I said, Brian... Ask God to forgive you. Get on your knees. I dealt with him for over three hours. What are you saying, preacher? This man should become a judge. And he set himself up as a judge if he was not qualified. I asked Brother Carl Wright the other day. I said, Brother Carl, they called him down and didn't believe it. So they broke a leg off and went in all rich. They, they paid this guy about $100 a week, Brother Carl. About $100 a week. And so Brother Carl was a consultant engineer. And so I, I asked him, I said, Brother Carl, he said, they're going to pull that rig out there. I said, can he set up? He said, I don't think so. And so he pulled it out there and broke the leg off of it. I said, did you ever break a leg off one of them all rigs? He said, yeah. I said, when did you break one off? He said, in 67. I said, how much did it cost to get it fixed? He said, 250000 in 67. That's, that's pretty good little shot. 250000 in 67. I wonder what it cost to get one fixed in 89. This guy here said, I watched Brother Carl Wright. Jack one oil. I'm a consultant. I don't think it works that way. I mean, Carl Wright went from East Texas. I mean, through the oil field for 25 years. And here it is 30-something years later. And all oh, she learned how to jack the rig up and move. This guy here has got three days training. Old side. Does that remind you of some Christian people? <laughs> Why, man, I'll have you to know that I went to Jack Wood and Peter Rutman School, and I've been born a year and a half, and if you want to know anything about the Bible, ask me. Furthermore, you don't have to ask me. I'll tell you without you asking. <laughs> yeah. 
And so your head just continued to swell. You kind of remind me of one of my kids one morning. Gene guys walked in, and one of my children had took the mumps that morning. And Gene looked at Marcia and said, Man, you're having a swell time, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. All right. But you can't accept charges without the witness being verified. So before you start talking about anybody, why don't you just walk up to Dan and have you? He said, Brother Dan, I know you're just a straight shooter. You've been here for Brother Wood 10 years. What do you think about me? Have you been that? Miss Whitford came to me one day and she said, uh, I guess it's been 10 years ago. Miss Whitford said to me, she said, uh, she's playing an organ, and she walked over here to me, and she said, now you preach this morning, and we should have a checkup. What's wrong with me? I said, you talk too much. She said, thank you, Pastor, and walked out. I said, no, she's a good man. What about being you, man? Huh? You said, preacher, I'm not going to come and ask you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But you know what? I do have a lot of people ask me that. And usually the ones that ask me are those that don't need any help, really. And those that really need help, they'll never ask me. You know, I won't go my foot like that one time because it's never been true. I won't go my foot like that. The reason I did that is because I stepped on the nail. That nail was just went about that deep, Tom. And then I stepped on the rock and bruised. And uh, I, you know, I knew what that time was going to do. So I walked on my foot. My toes were just a couple of years ago. I walked on that thing, and I was just a little kid. And I walked out there, about 12 years old, and I walked on that thing, and Mama finally said, you get that truck. She put me a big truck on it, and I knocked the car over, and he cut it with a knife. And he was mad. That thing was a boom, 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 boom. It was hurt for me to fix it. He just stuck a pair of scissors in there and opened the seat. Oh, my Lord. That was the hurtingest, feeling goodest thing I've ever seen in my life. It, it stopped hurting and started hurting, but the starting hurting didn't hurt me as bad as the other hurting did. My soul! And you know, we just don't like to puncture one of them deadly wounds. It's chill. Baby, well, you, you can't accept charges without a witness being verified. Percy Foreman was trying a case here years ago. And somebody asked him, said, Mr. Foreman, the judge, the prosecutor attorney, the, the judge said, said, don't you believe in capital punishment? And he pointed at two policemen that had caught this little black man. And uh, the little black man claimed that they put two sticks of weed in his pocket. And uh, they were trying him for it. And uh, Percy Foreman said, yeah, I, I believe in capital punishment. And, uh, and um, they said that he'd uh, killed somebody at another time. They had a pocket stick stolen. And finally they said, well, don't you believe in capital punishment? Oh, he said, yeah. Sure, I believe you have Apostle Paul and Apostle John here. He said, there's two lying police. <laughs> Amen. So don't be coming and telling me about other people. When you go to the preacher's house, you're talking about yourself. Why behold us a moat that is in thy brother's eye? Did you ever notice when the devil gets you to looking at other people, how it is little bitty things in their lives that you can see? that you never did see before when you were friends with them and loved them. And it is strange that people that you don't like, how big those little things are, and people that you do like, how little the big things are. Isn't that strange? I knew a preacher one time. He's a tough preacher. And boy, he really preached against other people's sins. But uh, his children, he had two grown boys, and they lived right there in the house. And thank God since then, both of them been saved, and one of them been called a preacher. I thank God for that. But them boys would just stay home. Wouldn't come to church. Just live like the devil. And boy, he'd just recommend the church and people there. But see, you've got to be careful about trying to get that beam, that mold out of your brother's eye. That's what the Bible said. You've got to, you've got to get that witness to make them better. Let me give you the last thing. You cannot pass sentence without a jury hearing it. You've got to hear the whole case. You've got to hear all the facts. And you know, a lot of times, Brother Bobby, Young Christians just say things you shouldn't say, but they don't know anything. Did you ever notice a little baby? They get up to the table. Here's a baby three years old, and here's a baby a year old, and they're sitting up at the table, and that little year old baby picks up his oatmeal, throws it in the floor, and says, Go on! You pick it up, put the oatmeal back in the floor, 
back in his bowl and sit back down and say, Junior, eat. That three or four year old, he pitched his bullets, said, That looks pretty good. He throws it in the floor. He put it back in the bowl, put it on his head. <laughs> I mean, what's the difference? One of them was a year old. He don't know any better. One of them's four years old. He knows better. Now, if an 11-year-old does that, you take him to the bathroom. You really have to talk to people. Yeah. Amen? So, don't you imagine that God is a heavenly Father? And don't you imagine somebody's been saved a few months, that God is his children? He knows who's been saved six months, and he knows who's been saved 20 years. And some things that you get by with, I don't believe he'd let me and Dan Meadows get by with. Because by the time we start doing it, he said, hey. I said, you can't, you, pa- you can't pass sentence without a jury. You know what the Bible says, and I know you hate to believe this, but in 1 Corinthians 6, it said, no, you're not, that the saints shall judge the world. You know, nobody wants to believe that all of God's children one day is going to judge the world. I, I tell you, if you're really having a bad time with God's people and you're not saved, you better be careful. Because one day they're going to judge you. Amen. You see, you better what are you real sure of that? Now, I'm going to read it to you. I, I see some of y'all look at any kind of strange, like, like that I'm not in the Bible, but I'm reading the Bible. I, I read in the newspaper. Uh, this past week, it said that we accept the Bible as blind authority. Nothing blind about the Bible. I just accept it as authority, standing in the truth and in the light. I don't, I'm not blind. I, I've got two good eyes, I can see. And the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, Dare any of you having a matter against another? Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, who are you unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Whatever little matter is in the church. It looks like to me the saints can handle it. Amen? Looks like they can handle it. I remember one night here many, many years ago in this church. I, I don't know why. The Lord gave me a message on money. And I preached on money. Borrowing money in the church. And uh, owing people in the church. I might all preach again. I don't know I had to tell the press to. But uh, I preached it that night. And when I got through, I just started out. You remember this for the day? Would you hear what I did? And I said, Do you owe anybody? Do you owe anybody? One of them said, What they need, I'd be glad to pay them. I said, How long you owe them? Oh, about two years. I said, They don't need it. That's the reason you went to them and borrowed. Because they got something. But you need to pay it. And you need to pay it tonight. Oh, brother, words, you didn't do that, did you? And one man, he had bought a shotgun off of one of the brothers in the church. And he had it about a year and a half, never had paid for it. And another man, he bought a piano off one of the brothers. And he hadn't paid for it. Now you think about going out on Saturday night, praying for fuck man, this one was a shotgun, this one was an iron box, this one was a piece of furniture. It'd be pretty hard to play with them people. Because, you know, you have both hands on your pocket. <laughs> Amen. And so what did we do? Well, we just said like that that night. We just said like that night. There's going to be no more borrowing in this church. Amen. You see, your brother and me, you want to help him? Help him. There ain't going to be no borrowing in this church. And so they just, they just one man stood up and he said, uh, well, Brother Wood, I, I, I didn't know there was anything wrong with this. And he'd owed a man for two and a half years. And the man signed a note. He had been paid. Why? Well, God knows. They know used to. You know, it's terrible to borrow five hundred dollars from my family. It's, it's worse than that. Standing in church and lying. I said, you need to do something wrong. Yeah. Well, you just a downright lie. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. And you borrowed five hundred dollars from somebody. Y'all paid. Should you pay it? I don't know how come I get unconvicted. I just pick a book up in my in my office and I can look in and it's not mine. And I, I, I just tell my wife to send it home. And if all y'all bring home my books, y'all got, man, I'd have a great good life. <laughs> Amen. 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 You can't pass sentence. You can't pass sentence 
without a jury. Now, again, I want to say, there's some things in the Bible that God said, I'm not judging when I tell you all have sinned and come short of the glory. I'm not lying. I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what God said. And, and when I tell you there ain't no drunkard, ain't no liars and thieves and whoremongers going into heaven, I'm, I'm not telling you what I think. I'm reading that out of the Word of God. I'm reading that out of the Word of God. When I said, Thou shalt not lie, and thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not commit adultery, you said, Brother, with us in the Old Testament, and Jesus put it in the New Testament. Yeah. Paul verified it all the way through the Gospel there. Now, you can't pass sentence without a jury here. Nowadays, if you don't want a jury to hear your trial, you can just ask for a judge. You can just ask for a judge. But it's a white throne judgment. If I get it right in the Bible, I said Christ is going to sit on the throne. I don't know why. I don't have any earthly idea why. But he's going to sit on the throne, and the whole church of God is going to be there. And every lost sinner that's never been saved walks before that great white throne. They're going before the judge and the jury. Yonder's the judgment seat of Christ. Only Christ is going to be sitting on the throne, and all the church of God is going to meet the judge of the universe. What's he going to judge them for, brother Wood? Whether it be good or bad, after they got saved. Saved! To be judged according to their work, whatever they've done. Go in the judgment box. But I want to say this you have no right to pass judgment on no matter. You don't have to judge not the smallest matter, nothing, nothing. This is church life, this is church family. This is church matter. And you say, I believe Brother Wood ought to do so and so. I believe God put that he knows exactly what he wants to do. Amen. Yes, sir. Uh, amen. No. Yes, he knows what he wants to do. I told a man down in South America, and I've told this a dozen times. I told a young man one time in South America, I'd won him to the Lord, and he was a member of a communist out there. And I said to him, Brother Lenny, and Brother Gene said, Matthew, you verified it. I, I said, God is really got my heart. You're going to get hurt for this there's just some people don't need no pistol. My, my daughter-in-law, she's one of them sitting there. She, she said the boss had bought a pistol. I said, honey, don't touch it. Please don't touch that pistol. If anybody comes to rob, give them the pistol. Just give them the pistol. Don't, you know, just, just say, hey, here's you something else to go with. Amen? And they, they'll be glad you did, you know? And they go rob somebody, but just give them the money. Just tell them it's all injured or going down. You know, some people just don't need to touch a pistol. But uh, Brother Lenny, he even went and got his horse from Mexico and went on his left hand side when he was in left hand. I mean, he looked just like a long time. <laughs> so one day, Brother Gene sent him out there to fix some fence down in Paraguay, and uh, he uh, looked out there and he seen a great big, one of those big deer. These deer weighed about 200 and some pounds. They're big deer, just had big spike horn like that. He looked at that big, we called him a cerebro. And he looked at that big cerebro, and he reached and he got his pistol, and it was about 10 feet from him. He said, he didn't do nothing. A big 38 pistol. He reached, and what happened? Garland Sanders had forgot to put the powder in that gun, in that shell. So what he did, he just said, and he knocked the lid in there. What did Lenny do? Pull that hammer up again, and he pulled the trigger. And great was the explosion there. <laughs> he blowed the whole side out of that pistol. He'd come back turned, so like this. He looked like a little kid that had broke. He looked like somebody took a saw. He saw down to the side. He took one part of that. He came from the back. 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 And he said to Brother Gene Cowell, Can you fix this? <laughs> Is that the truth, Brother Gene? That's the honest truth. That's right. I mean, he, and you know, why would I sit around and say, Hey, Lenny, I told you so. He wouldn't have understood that. Only thing he understood was the explosion. He never picked up another pistol. I said, Brother Lenny, I don't know what's wrong with your eyes. But you don't seem like you can see this. He said, You know, you come to a red light? Can't you see? He said, "Well, I thought that light was green." I come to find out he was colored blind. I tried to talk Mother Lenny for years, but Gene, you remember this so well. And I had what they call a moral man. This big blue iron gray man was a monster of a man, but she's a moral. And I forgive him. He ended up talking, and she was excited. She was wild. 
and we just kept her. She had cold, but she didn't ride. She had never been rolled. She had never had a saddle on. But there was any time, I drove down an airplane, scooped down to the old jungle place, I stopped in the nose, and the bottom, he ran and got the bottom. I said, saddle two horses and come and hit me about 40 miles from the airstream. He got all of his provisions and everything, put them all up, put his sights of books on his bread on that. Yeah! Then he stepped up on a gentleman who had ride, couldn't ride, stick on, and he got up and had to run, and I said, Get up! She got up! She got to walking on them clouds, and then he was hot on the clothesline. There it was, out to drive. Flour and biscuits scattered from the head of yonder. I said, Brother Lenny, please, you know nothing about a gun. You're colorblind. You don't know a black horse from a green one. One of the finest Christian men you ever met. Raised some of the finest Christian boys that I've ever known. I didn't have his eyesight, nor his gun sight a bit. Why would you want to sit around and criticize Brother Lee? Because him and Hattie, I married them 25 years ago. They said, now 28 years ago. They said, now and a half, they can get to all singing Amazing Grace. How sweet to sound. They could care less about it. They grew in the Lord. They grew in the grace of God. He didn't know this. Brother Gene, remember? I told him, I said, I said, man, what happened to the pastor? And he killed me a 9,000-pound steer, and we're going to eat it. He goes down and kills my ox. <laughs> I said, he's a yellow steer. He killed Osama a red blood red steer. I said, that's the last time Lenny killed anything right here. <laughs> but nothing wrong with his character, but nothing wrong with his spiritual life. He just didn't know one color from the other. Amen? He didn't know nothing about a gun. I tell you, he knew something about hard work. He knew something about reading that Bible. He knew something about worshiping God. He was a real Christian gentleman. Still is today. Preacher Boyd, nearly 30 years ago, in 1950-something, I won him in a communist outfit in Austin, Texas, to Christ. And he's still going on today. Don't be judging people. Let the jury hear it. And this is the jury, the church of God. Let them hear it. Let them hear the matter. You got a problem and you can't solve it, bring it to the church. I mean, Dan, you got something you just can't solve and work with, bring it right here to the church. You got some job you solve, you just can't get a set, bring it right from the church. Raise your hand. Isn't it strange how, how tough we claim we are and how big a sisters we really are? Just raise your hand and say, Brother Wood, this is Wednesday night. And Brother Bobby Cox is a real ugly me today, and, and I, I'd like to stand up and say a word. But I said, you have to say it. He Brother Bobby just got through, just so ugly, but what did he do to me? And Brother Bobby, he followed my call in the parking lot and slapped one of my kids. He said, Brother Bobby wouldn't do that. I know he wouldn't. But if he did do it, why do you want to go tell Sister Sawyer's in the bathroom? <laughs> she can't help you. She got her mind on the bathroom. And here we got our mind on God's business. It's church business. Bring it right here in the church. And say, Brother Wood, I got a problem. I went to him and I can't get it solved. What did the Bible tell you to do? Said, take somebody in the church and go down and see him. He didn't get solved, what can I do? Said, bring it to the church. How many times have you ever saw it brought to the church? Never. What happens when you bring it to the church? They said, he's ugly. And he's hard. And he's mean. I put a lady out of the church years ago. They dropped all the time. When they found her dying on the bed, on the floor, she fell on the floor and lay in and said, Tell Brother Jack. I churched her 20 years before. She said, Tell Brother Jack, I want him to preach my funeral. And she kept pointing to something. Her boy didn't know what it was. And Leon reached over there. And there her Bible was laying on a nightstand. And in that Bible, it said to Lorraine from the preacher, Brother Jack, I'd give her a big letter Bible to read years before. 
people respect you. Just being dead honest and kind and gracious and tender-hearted to people that need help. Let's pray. God, don't need any judge. He's the judge. Isn't it strange how many times we want to set ourselves up as God? God don't need no jury. He's got the church. Isn't it strange how many times we want to take the place of the church? Just knowing the facts and laying down whatever the problem might be, it can be solved in the church of God, by the church of God. When every other matter fails, the church of God can solve whatever matter they is. And if I can't solve it, there's one thing I always can do, I can resolve it. Amen. Once you can't solve it, then you've got to resolve it. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name tonight. We know the Bible is the Word of God. We have no right as God's people to be a judge of one another. We're to love one another. The Bible said, Lord, that all men should know that we're your disciples if we love the brethren. Lord God, this last world will know that we're your children when we love them and pray over a godless world that's without Christ. Lord God, speak to us tonight. May God's will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us all to stand. May the Lord bless you for being in God's house. I want to speak to you from the Word of God tonight. God is the judge. We don't need to take his place. The preacher is the pastor. We don't need to take his place. We need to find our place. And we find our place, get in the church of God and do whatever the Lord wants you to do. God don't want you to be the judge of nobody. God don't want you to set yourself as a judge. Quit digging around other people's eyes and just keep yourself clean before God. God let you help other people. Let God speak to you tonight. Let God deal with your heart. You pray for those men down in that tent. You pray that God would give them numbers of souls. The Baptist people have just folded their tents. Back in the old days, the old time Methodists, they had their tents. They're on fire for God, building churches all over this country. And then they come along the Baptists, they come right along behind them and they had their tents and they got out and preached and had crusades and won people to God. But nowadays, nowadays, it's not the sinner. Sinner's the same, Bible's the same, sin's the same, everything's the same. But uh, they'll be saved when we get out there and work in the fields, work hard and labor and preach, sing and try to get sinners saved. Our Father, we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you to be in the house of God tonight. Lord, to be here in a good crowd of people and then to know that those young men down there, Lord, are laboring, uh, Brother Jimmy and Jack and uh, Mike and all them boys down there tonight, Brother Gene Pereira, Lord God, Chuck, and the rest of them down there just trying to get somebody saved. We pray, Father, you bless those young men. Pray the Spirit of God to have his way. Uh, lead and guide and direct us, Lord. Let us take the admonition tonight from the Lord. To encourage our lives, strengthen our lives. And, uh, get us out of this thing, criticism, ugliness toward one another, that we may love one another, love and pray one for another, that we might not sin against thee. God bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.